Raymond's Run, Tony, Cade, Bambara. I don't have much work to do around the house like some girls. My mother does that, and I don't have to earn my pocket money by running errands and selling Christmas cards. My brother George does that, and anything else that's got to get done, my father does. All I have to do is mind my brother Raymond, which is enough. He's much bigger and he's older too, but a lot of people call him my little brother because he's not quite right and needs looking after. And if any of these smart mouths try to pick on Raymond, they have to deal with me. And I don't believe in just standing around talking. I'd much rather knock them down and take my chances, even if I am a girl with skinny arms and a squeaky voice, which is how I got my nickname Squeaky. And if things get too rough, I run. As anybody can tell you, I'm the fastest thing on two feet. There is no track meet where I don't win the first place medal. I used to win the 20-yard dash when I was a little kid. Nowadays, it's the 100-yard dash. I'm the swiftest thing in the neighborhood. Everybody knows that, except the two people who know better, my father and me. My father can beat me in a race to Amsterdam Avenue with me getting a head start and him running with his hands in his pockets and whistling. But can you imagine a 35-year-old man stuffing himself into a pair of shorts just to beat his kid in a race? So, as far as everyone was concerned, I'm the fastest. Except for Gretchen, who has put out the story that she is going to win the first place medal this year. Ridiculous. No one can beat me. And that's all there is to that. After school, I usually take a walk down Broadway so I can practice my breathing exercises. I always keep Raymond walking on the inside, close to the buildings, because he's subject to fits of fantasy and sometimes starts thinking he's a circus performer and that the curb is a tightrope strung high in the air. Or sometimes, if I don't watch him, he'll run across traffic to one of the parks and give the pigeons a fit. Then I have to go around apologizing to all the people sitting on the benches who are all shook up with the pigeons fluttering around them, scattering newspapers and upsetting their sack lunches. So I keep Raymond on the inside, and today he starts playing like he's driving a stagecoach. This is okay with me, so long as he doesn't run over me or interrupt my breathing exercises, which I have to do on account of I'm serious about my running and don't care who knows it. Now, some people like to act like things come easy to them and won't let on that they practice, but not me. You can see me any time of the day practicing. I never walk if I can run, and Raymond always keeps up because if he hangs back, someone is likely to walk up behind him and get smart and take his allowance. So I'm going down Broadway, breathing in and breathing out in counts of seven. And suddenly here comes Gretchen with her sidekicks. Mary Louise, who used to be a friend of mine when she first moved to Harlem from Cincinnati. And Rosie, who is as fat as I'm skinny and has a big mouth where Raymond is concerned and is too stupid to know that there is not a big deal of difference between herself and Raymond. So they are coming up Broadway and I see right away that it's going to mean trouble because the street ain't that big. First, I think I'll step into the candy store and look over the new comics and let them pass. But that's chicken. And I've got a reputation to consider. So then I think I'll just walk straight on through them or over them if necessary. But as they get to me, they slow down. You signing up for the field day races, smiles Mary Louise. A dumb question like that doesn't deserve an answer. I don't think you're going to win this time, says Rosie, trying to signify with her hands on her hips all salty. I always win because I'm the best, I say straight at Gretchen. Gretchen smiles, but it's not really a smile. And I'm thinking that girls never ever really smile at each other because they don't know how and don't want to know how. Then Rosie looks at Raymond, who has just brought his make-believe stagecoach to a stop. And she's about to see what trouble she can stir up through him. What grade you in now, Raymond? She asks. You got anything to say to my brother? You say it to me, I tell her. What are you, his mother? Sasses Rosie. That's right, fatso. So they just stand there. Gretchen puts her hands on her hips and is about to say something but doesn't. Then she walks around me and looks me up and down, but she keeps moving up Broadway and her sidekicks follow her. So me and Raymond smile at each other and he says giddy up to his team of horses and I continue with my breathing exercises. On field day, I take my time getting to the park because the track meet is the last thing on the program. I put Raymond on the swings. Then I look around for Mr. Pearson, pins the numbers on. I'm really looking for Gretchen, if you want to know the truth, but she's not around. The park is packed with parents in hats and little kids in white dresses and light blue suits. 
Some older guys with their caps on backwards are leaning against the fence, swirling basketballs on the tips of their fingers, waiting for all these crazy people to clear out so they can play. Then here comes Mr. Pearson with his clipboard and his cards and pencils and whistles and 50 million other things he's always dropping. He sticks out in the crowd because he looks like he's on stilts. We used to call him Jack the Beanstalk to get him mad, but I'm the only one who can outrun him and get away. And now I'm too grown for silly name calling. Well, Squeaky, he says, checking my name off the list and handing me number seven and two pins. I'm thinking he's got no right to call me Squeaky if I don't call him Beanstalk. Hazel, Elizabeth, Deborah, Parker, I correct him and tell him to write it down that way on his board. Well, Hazel, Elizabeth, Deborah, Parker, are you going to give someone else a break this year? I squint at him real hard to see if he is seriously thinking I should lose the race on purpose just to give someone else a break. Only eight girls running this time he continues shaking his head sadly like it's my fault all of new york didn't turn out in sneakers that new girl should give you a run for your money he looks around the park for gretchen with a periscope in a submarine movie wouldn't it be a nice gesture if you were to to um I give him such a look that he can't finish putting that idea into words. Then I pin number seven on myself and stomp away. I'm so burnt. I go straight to the track and stretch out on the grass. The man on the loudspeaker begins calling everyone over to the track for the first event, which is the 20-yard dash. The race takes two minutes because most of the little kids don't know better than to run off the track or turn the wrong way or run smack into the fence and fall down and cry. Then comes the 50-yard dash, and I don't even bother to turn my head to watch because Rafael Perez always wins by psyching out the other runners, telling them they're going to fall on their faces or lose their shorts or something. Then I hear my brother Raymond hollering from the swings. He knows I'm about to do my thing because the man on the loudspeaker has just announced the 100-yard dash. I get up and slip off my sweatpants, and then I see Gretchen standing at the starting line, kicking her legs like a pro. Then, as I get into place, I see Raymond on the other side of the fence, bending down with his fingers on the ground, just like he knew what he was doing. I start to yell at him, but I don't. It burns up your energy to holler. Just before I take off in a race, I always feel like I'm in a dream. The kind of dream you have when you're sick with fever and feel all hot and weightless. I dream I'm flying over a sandy beach in the early morning sun, touching the leaves of the trees as I fly by. And all the time I feel myself getting lighter and lighter. Then I spread my fingers in the dirt and crouch over for the get on your mark yell. I stop dreaming and I'm solid again and tell myself, Squeaky, you must win. You must win. You are the fastest thing in the world. You can even beat your father if you try. And then I feel my weight coming back just behind my knees, then down to my feet and the pistol shot explodes in my blood and I'm off and weightless again, flying past the other runners. My arms pump up and down and the whole world is quiet except for the crunch crunch as I zoom over the gravel on the track. I glance to my left and there's no one. But to my right is Gretchen, who's got her chin jutting out as if it would win the race all by itself. And on the other side of the fence is my brother Raymond, with his arms down at his side and the palms tucked up behind him, running in his very own style. It's the first time I've ever seen him do that, and I almost stop to watch. But the white ribbon is bouncing towards me, and I tear past it, running hard till my feet, with a mind of their own, start digging up footfuls of dirt and stop me. Then all the kids standing on the sidelines pile on me, slapping me on the back with their field day programs because they think I've won again. And everybody on the 151st Street can walk tall for another year. In first place, the man on the loudspeaker pauses and the loudspeaker starts to whine. Then some static. I lean down to catch my breath and I see Gretchen doing the same thing, huffing and puffing with her hands on her hips, taking it slow, breathing in steady time like a real pro. And I sort of like her a little for the first time. In the first place! Then three or four voices get all mixed up on the loudspeaker and I dig my sneakers in the grass and stare at Gretchen, who's staring back, both wondering just who did win. I can hear old Beanstalk arguing with the man on the loudspeaker about what the stopwatch is saying. Then I hear Raymond yanking at the fence and calling me, and I wave to shush him. But he keeps rattling the fence and then starts climbing nice and easy. And it occurs to me, watching how smoothly he climbs and remembering how he looked running with the wind pulling his mouth back and his teeth showing and all, it occurs to me that 
Raymond would make a very fine runner. Doesn't he always keep up with me on my practices? And he surely knows how to breathe in counts of seven, cause he's always doing it at the dinner table. And I'm smiling to beat the band, because if I've lost this race, or if me and Gretchen have tied, or even if I've won, I can always retire as a runner and begin a whole new career as a coach with Raymond as my champion. So I stand there laughing out loud as Raymond jumps down from the fence and runs over to me with his arms down at his side in his own running style. And by the time he comes over, I'm jumping up and down. I'm so glad to see him. But of course, everyone thinks I'm jumping up and down because the men have finally gotten themselves together and the loudspeaker is announcing, in first place, Miss Hazel Elizabeth Deborah Parker. In second place, Miss Gretchen B. Lewis. And I look over to Gretchen, wondering what the B stands for. And I smile. Maybe she'd like to help me coach Raymond because she's obviously serious about running. And she nods to congratulate me. And then she smiles too. And it's about as real a smile as girls can do for each other, considering we don't practice it as much as we should every day.